uh, hi everyone. So it's it's official time to begin the talk. I think we'll we'll give it another maybe five minutes for people to join. Um, yeah. So let's let's wait for a bit more. Thanks. Thanks for coming. All right. Uh, okay. Let's let's slowly start and. Um, yeah, please let me know in the in the chat if there are any issues with uh, with the stream, if you can hear me well or not. <clears throat> and also, if you have any questions, feel free to post them on the chat. Uh, there there will be a Q and A section in the end of this talk, but I will be looking at the questions once in a while. Maybe sometimes we can address something really quick. All right. So so thanks thanks for coming to my talk. <clears throat> the topic is machine learning and that's ranking. <coughs> Sorry, uh, my name is Oleg Tishutin, uh, and I have I have like about ten years experience in machine learning uh, uh, for ads ranking. I currently work for Meta. Uh, I also like used to work for another company uh, that was building machine learning solutions for for advertising businesses. Um, and yeah, so the outline of the talk will talk a little bit about like ads in general what advertising is, what kind of players are there, and uh, what is personalized advertising, and uh, what what are maybe like the most important business metrics for that, and how machine learning like fits into the larger picture. And then then we'll uh, we'll look at the one of the popular solutions, which is based on uh, logistic regression, like in more details. And then we'll look at another one that's based on neural network that seems to be the most popular one these days. And like finally, to wrap the things up, I will I will discuss about like things that we did not mention and some some challenges of like real life advertising systems. <coughs> Sorry, like I have a minor cough. All right, so let's let's uh, let's start with uh, introduction into like advertising and advertising landscape. So there are there are let let's say to oversimplify, there are like two two big like business models in the advertising landscape. One of them is the advertiser. So we also call it like demand side business. And what advertiser does, advertiser knows like how to manufacture something. It, it and 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 they want to they want to sell whatever they manufacture, and they are willing to pay. They are willing to pay to attract more customers. As long as long as the economy works out for them, as long as they make more money on selling stuff. Uh, then they pay to attract new customers. They are willing to pay uh, to get more customers. So, advertising might be like some uh, some like business that manufactures like some real real like tangible goods like perfume or clothing. But it can also be like a company that manufactures like video games or some intangible goods, and they want to get as many installs as possible. And ideally, they want to get like as many paying customers as possible. In the end, it all boils down to getting paying customers. <coughs> all right, <clears throat> and another another side of the business is called like supply, and um, usually like the 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 publisher business is like the business that actually shows ads. Um, so usually a publisher business is kind of a magazine, a newspaper, a TV channel, radio station, and like these days it can be like a social platform like Twitter or Reddit or Snap, and they so usually users go to that platform not to look at the ads right like usually usually users go to the platform to interact with content created by other users maybe their friends maybe creators but definitely not for ads but those platforms also show you ads um and 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 their business model is that they selling advertising space to advertisers they they charge advertisers uh for showing their ads and uh, like in in the end, that's how they make money. That's that's how that's like what what Twitter runs on. It it gets it gets money from from advertisers, and it funds like all the infrastructure on the servers, like and, and whatnot. So so if like uh, to outline like the whole scheme of things is like uh, so advertiser advertiser wants to sell goods to the user, right? <coughs> so if advertiser is like manufacturing lipstick, <clears throat> what advertiser wants to do? Advertiser wants to sell. A lipstick to the user and get money from the user in exchange and to get more users like to get more buyers uh, to get more customers advertisers are pay some money to the publisher to show ads like uh, in grand scheme of things advertiser pays publisher 
for new customers, right? Like it adds adds is a way to attract new customers, but like philosophically, advertiser pays publisher for new customers, and yeah, and publisher is like showing some interesting content to the user, and also like somewhere around this interesting content there will be an ad, and hopefully like user will see the ad and convert. And the way all this economy works, it all works on users' money. The money that user pays to like to advertiser when user actually buys something from the advertiser, right? Part of this money goes to advertiser like as a profit and <coughs> part of this money goes to the publisher for showing the ads so like all this all this like ecosystem is funded by users money all right and and now like let, let's look at like personalized ads so the the way the way ads work on the internet is that like each user looking at the ad uh, like we'll, we'll see different ad uh, different users like opening the same page maybe like on on New York Times or maybe on Reddit, they will actually see different ads. And if if all ads work really well, they consider users' interests. And user interested like in lipstick will see a lipstick ad. And user interested in sports like will be sport equipment ad. And hopefully, because of those ads, user will actually buy something, right? And that unlocks a lot of value. Um, so, <coughs> and how this technically works? Like, how do we choose which ad to show to this user? So consider like there is one user who is about to open a page and we know about this user like this. This user is interested like in music. And so different advertisers like start bidding process. So different advertisers, uh, for example, there are like three advertisers selling cosmetics and musical instruments and like sports equipment. They start bidding process and they say that like, uh, for example, lipstick advertiser says like, oh, I want, I, I, I'm happy to show ad to this user if it will cost me like point, point one dollar or less. And music advertiser says, like, I'm happy to show a musical ad to, to this user if it costs me $7 or less. And the sports equipment advertiser says, like, I'm happy to show the ad to this user if it costs me, like, $3 or less. Right? And since, like, all these advertisers probably know that this user is interested in music, music advertiser, like, thinks that their ads will be the most relevant, so they bid the highest. And then, then the, like, ads delivery system runs the auction and chooses the ad with the highest bid and shows that ad. So in, in our case, the ad with the highest bid will be like a guitar ad, right? And, and so this is what the user will see, uh, right? And it works the same way for all the users, like open the same web page, but the decision is made differently for each user because different users have different interests. <coughs> Sorry, and so like the user who is more interested in lipstick, but those users advertisers who advertise lipstick like will, will bid higher and the lipstick ads will win and for sports equipment the same, right? So this is how it works. Uh, so the, the outline is that like of the whole ad serving system is that if we are looking at this like from Twitter point of view or like uh, some like social platform point of view, like right, how it works. So on one hand, there are advertisers like on the right, advertisers usually tell the platform what they want. They say like, okay, I want to show this ad. If user clicks on this ad, user should land on this website and I'm giving you like some advertising budget, like, I don't know, a thousand, uh, like thousand dollars for one month. And please bring it, bring me as many customers as possible. That's like very typical um, requirement, like from advertising. So user inputs all that data, like into the uh, into the ads, like into the ads platform. And and then what that ad, ads platform does is like when user opens the app or a web page on their phone, and there will be like a place where the ad will be shown. And so. Uh, while while the page is loading, like while the app is loading, usually it takes a couple of seconds. <coughs> the phone also sends like requests to the servers, and what the servers do, like servers run the auction between all the possible ads. So for all the possible ads from various advertisers, um, first like they compute the bids for each ad, like how much money the ad is willing to pay to get shown to this user, and like using all the data we have about the ad about the user right here right now, and then. Uh, when we computed all the bids, the auction chooses the ad that bid the most, right? And this ad gets shown to you. So um, we'll 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 focus on the bidder part because like the bidder part that has like the most heavyweight like machine learning solution. Um, and so how bids are computed? Uh, basically, basically the way we compute the bid is we compute expected value that we are bringing to advertising. And what we usually know. Like we, we know how much advertiser is willing to pay per each purchase from the user. Either advertiser gives us that number or we try to guess it, but let's consider that this number is given. <coughs> and then we predict uh, what's the probability of user actually making a purchase 
uh, for this user right now for this ad like shown at this page right wow. so the machine learning model that we will be discussing further on in this talk like has like the sole goal of predicting the probability of user interacting with the ad usually we're interested in purchases so usually usually those models are used to predict if we show this ad to this user right now on this page what is the probability of user buying something after seeing that right um so yeah so this so this kind of model it usually it usually like use three sources of data data like about supply data like which page are we is user like looking at right now what is the placement of the ad is that in the middle of the page or like somewhere on the side is it like the placement large or small and like user data everything we know about the user where user is right now sometimes we can know user location from ip and which device user is using and of course like user history if we have any history about the user ads user interacted with before or maybe like a disguises users purchase something from before that can be super valuable and finally we use demand data data about the ad <coughs> data about the ad itself uh, like size of the ad well like, is it like a static ad or like a video ad and like of course if we know anything about like users who clicked on this ad before like we can also encode this information like about the ad maybe it's like a list of list of users who clicked on this ad before something like that or average average click rate on that and so all this data is collected by and feed fed into like predict model and predict model gives one number probability of user interacting with this ad and this this number is then used to compute the bid and to to choose which ad gets to be shown and how much money we charge advertiser for right and that that's why we need good prediction so the the business metrics that we will be looking at <coughs> in the end is like how optimal our system is right and if if prediction how how well the prediction works affects two things which ad gets chosen to be selected and how much advertiser will be charged for showing this ad. and if predictions are really bad that we are we are operating in suboptimal way we're showing the wrong ads the user who is interested in music will get like lipstick ads and just will not interact with them that's like one thing and another thing we will be charging advertisers too much money because we'll be expecting user to actually like engage highly with the ad and if that doesn't happen we like over predicted overestimated user engagement but we charged advertiser based on our expectation and what happens in the end is that like we lose we lose conversion events so like the the purchases driven by our ads will go down and that's one thing which is bad advertisers will be unhappy and then second thing we'll be charging too much and we'll be charging more from advertisers for bringing less results so in the end advertisers will just like pull out advertising budgets and like for the next period they will just like spend less money on our advertising platform right so this like this was like a business business side of things now <coughs> now we can deep dive like into machine learning part of things so um right so we want to build machine learning models that make like predictions and how do we do that uh, once again it's like some prediction model gets like a lot of information uh and makes like one one prediction just just a number of probability uh first of all which challenges are we facing like when we build this kind of model uh the challenges that we have like first of all we definitely need to think about how we're going to serve this model uh there is like millions or billions of users visiting some social platforms and you have to rank a lot of ads every second just to choose which ad to show to one user you have to rank all the ads you have like for all the ads available on your platform you have to compute probabilities and which like you might have like easily millions of ads so for 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 each for each user who is opening your like website or like app right now you have to rank like million of ads so that's like a lot a lot of ranking and you you need to make sure that you can actually handle that uh, like technically that it works fast enough that it's scalable enough and most importantly that it's like actually cost efficient because usually the amount of money the platform gains <coughs> sorry I'm not sure what's going on here uh yeah usually like amount of money platform gets from showing one ad is probably like a couple of dollars per thousand per like per thousand of ads the platform usually makes like a couple of dollars so the amount of CPU compute that you spend on ranking ads like should be should cost you less than that 
right? That's one thing. The other thing, like, it's a difficult modeling question because the data set is very unbalanced. You have a lot of examples of users who did not interact with the ad, and you have like very rare examples of users who interacted with the ad. Uh, so like, that's one issue. Another issue is that like, the data set is very sparse. Usually for each user, you have like a very small number of interactions. And for each ad, you also have like very small number of interactions. Somehow from that, you need to generalize and be able to predict for each user, for each ad, what is the probability of user interacting with that? Um, right. And like maybe one more thing to highlight <coughs> is being suboptimal is like costs you real money. You you charge advertisers money like if based on your predictions. So if you change predictions in some way to in, like, for example, you want to include exploration or something like that, you'll be charging more money. And that's like that advertisers will feel that immediately. And finally, like the business goals are not very well aligned with mathematical goals, which is also a big issue. And mathematically, we usually optimize for something on historical data, which is like log likelihood, which is like a very mathematical metric that describes how well model makes predictions. But in reality, the business is interested in something that is much harder to measure. Advertisers are usually interested in users who who bring like big long-time value, like users who are happy. Like Netflix would probably want not users who like subscribe to Netflix once. Netflix wants users who will stay with Netflix forever. And even to gather that kind of information about the user, okay, let's say maybe not forever, but like for one year, right? We'll have to wait for one year. And for some advertisers, they, they, they optimize for you their happiness, which which not also not only requires some time to measure, but it's like also very hard to quantify. Like advertisers like Amazon or like want want user not to make one purchase from them. They want they want returning user, user who comes frequently and buys something, and user who is happy doing that. And it's very difficult to measure and to optimize for. So offline, we usually like when we build the model, we optimize for some different like mathematical metric and hope that the metrics are aligned. All right. Uh, we'll skip a couple of slides, and basically, if you if you are not familiar with machine learning, or if you are, like a like very brief reminder, like how machine learning works. Um, so, basically, you want to build a model that has the least error on historical data, <coughs> like uh, right, like so. You have some historical data already collected. You know, like which users interacted with each ads or not, and. You just build a mathematical model that fits this data. You 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 build like you write down some formula. You ask a computer to write down some formula with some parameters, and you ask computer to identify those parameters so that the predictions of this model have like the least difference from what really happened in the past, right? Um, and which means that like you find optimal weights that minimize the error, uh, and which means that it's like a mathematical optimization problem. Um, so, like, to, to talk about this, like, in a bit more detail, so uh, let's say, like, you are given your historical data, right, about your impressions and conversions. Impression is when you show the ad. Conversion is, like, what user actually, when user actually does something after seeing the ad. And the historical data can be broken, like, down into, like, major major things. Is like, one is features, it's information about users and ads by the time when you show the ad, for example, like which user device user like which device user was using or which as user clicked before, something like that. And then you have labels. Labels is okay. Did the engagement happen between this user and this ad or not? Right. Usually historical data like features are denoted with X and labels with Y. <coughs> and then so you have this historical data. One thing. Another thing. You usually have a general formula for your model, and you only want to identify like the parameters of the formula. And like the most the most like simple formula you might have is like a constant, right? You just say that all users have like the same probability of interacting with all the ads. It's like one constant, and you ask computer, okay, what what is this? What is this average probability of user interacting with ad? What what is like the optimal value for that? What is which value fits the historical data the best? Yeah. And finally, finally, you have like the loss function that that explains how do you measure the difference between model predictions and actual data that you have, um, right? And and what you need to find, you need to find model parameters that minimize the loss function on historical data, right? So this is like a mathematical uh, overview like of this. And so how does it usually look in its ranking like machine learning task? Um, 
So the data set will look like this. Uh, you will have like a lot of IDs. So you have like add ID, which describes which ad we showed, user ID, which describes which user like saw the ad. Maybe you will have like a website where a user would go if they clicked on the ad, and you'll have like some, some information about the user, like country or device, and you will have like statistical counters, for example, how many clicks <coughs> user like you did before, and maybe you'll have some information if this user uh, like purchased from this advertising before or not. And then the final column in this data set will be like, did user actually engage with the ad when we showed it, right? So each row in this data set is the situation when we showed some ad to some user. Um, yeah, and you will like you will have these kind of logs and with like millions of rows. Um, and that's what you usually work with. And you will have like all the variety of features. There will be like very complicated features like explaining interactions between users and ads and their histories. But like, but this is like the most simplistic view. Right. So this is how the data set will look. Uh, so so like XK, YK, once again XK. It's like k is a row in this data set and then like xk is some numbers computed like on the all, all the columns in this data set excluding the last column and yk is the last column did conversion happen so when we serve the model we know values from from the features we know which ad we're going to show which user is going to see the ad user device and so on <coughs> during serving time when we compute probability and of course during serving time we don't know the label we don't know if the user is actually going to convert Right, so this is a data set. Uh, the model will be different in each solution. So I will explain the models like later when we look at the particular solutions. And the loss function is usually used like the same loss functions in all the, in all the ads ranking uh, uh, problems. And this loss function is based on log likelihood. This is some mathematical, like mathematically optimal in some way, loss function. Uh, the important part about it is that like it's computed per each row of your historical data. Right, so like it's just some, it's just some of something over all rows of your historical data, and for each row of your historical data, you basically compute how well prediction of the model aligns with if conversion happened or not. If conversion happened, y is like equals to one, and and you, like you want you want like the the model prediction like to be to be as high as possible. If the conversion did not happen, then you mo want model prediction to be as low as possible. Right, so this metric is like optimal in some mathematical way because it treats it works really well on like uh, unbalanced data sets when conversions are very rare. <laughs> and then there is usually some regularization uh, part of this formula, which basically says that don't believe your historical data too much, and there will probably be situations when like some user will look like they always click on all ads or some ads look like all users usually click on them like all the time or something like that. Like don't believe that too much and probably, probably there is like some noise. So like let's kind of smooth out a little bit our predictions and we have expectation that no user is clicking on all the ads or like no ad gets clicked by all the users. That's like that's what regularization term is enforcing here, and yeah, and then you just like minimize this function. And how do you minimize this function? Uh, how do you minimize this function? That's like a, that. There is like a cool theory behind it in 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 optimization theory, and like the most obvious way to do is gradient descent. It sounds super complicated. Like it's very easy in reality. You just like it's an iterative process. You start with some weights, with some parameters, and then you compute like a gradient of the loss function. And you just move and you shift your, you update your parameters like uh, in the opposite direction from the gradient. So like if, if you update your parameters in the same direction of the gradient, you will like increase, like your, your error will increase. If you update in the opposite direction, your error will decrease. This is like a super common solution for minimization, like for function minimization, like in mathematics, you can look it up, gradient descent. This is like, it might look difficult. Like once again, it's, it's like super common knowledge super super easy to do and the most popular version of it is called mini batch gradient descent which basically means that we compute we take like small number of samples from our historical data don't take all of them at the same time just take like small number of them maybe 100 or 200 or 500 and we we compute gradients on them at the gradients up the gradients of error function of loss function at the map <coughs> and update update the model weights in the opposite direction and then repeat. Uh, once again, like a very, very, very popular solution, and you can look it up. Okay, so now now let's look at one of the one of the production designs that people actually use. Uh, 
in real life. Um, this one is called logistic regression. This is probably the most simple solution you can come up with, um, but it's very powerful. And there's a couple of very good articles about it. One from Oliver Chappelle from Criteo, another one like from Google at Click Prediction View from the Trenches. Like I guarantee if you read both of these articles, you will have like very good understanding of how this works. Right, so, so, um, so as I said before, every solution, every machine learning like ads ranking solution consists of three things like historical data and uh, how you compute features based on it, uh, like general formula for the model and like the error function that you are minimizing on historical data, right? So for logistic regression uh, solution, uh, let's, this is just a screenshot from the article. Uh, so the, the model, the first formula like is a model, right? And it's just, it's just some, some function of scalar product between like the model weights and, and your features. The feature vector is like X, this information you know about the user and the ad, and you just multiply it by like some vector of parameters and you want to identify best values for those parameters, right? And then you like compute like exponent and divide like one by this value, but like that's that's just like some mathematics around it. And, and, the, and then the, the loss function is exactly, <coughs> exactly the function I presented before, but now since you know the model formula, you can plug it in into the loss function and like write write how it actually looks explicitly, and I think like one one more thing to point out in this article they use like L two regularization so they minimize uh, like the L two norm of the weights. Um, I'm not sure why they are doing that. It's it's better than nothing, and it makes your weights like somewhat reasonable, and it makes your model not believe the outliers. But there are better ways to do it, and we'll talk about it later. Right, so. That's pretty much it. And now the question is, so you have this historical data, right? That, uh, and it has like a lot of IDs. It has like user ID, ad ID, and it has like website name. How do you, how do you, how do you actually map the, like this list of IDs that you have in your historical data to actually a, a, like a number vector to multiply it by weight? Yeah, that's, that's, that's a question here. So one way to do it, uh, to map your historical data, like to, 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 to make a, like a vector of numbers, X out of your historical data is, is called one hot encoding. And the idea is very straightforward. So we just like have a very long binary vector, which is mostly zeros, right? And then if we were set to one, uh, the vector component that, uh, that um, like th that corresponds to a particular user ID. And then we like have another vector component that corresponds to a particular like website. Then we have another vector component like that corresponds to a particular ad ID or user ID. And then we can also encode like interaction features for each combination of user and ad. We can also have like different different position in our vector that will set to one. <coughs> so, so this will work. Uh, that's not bad. Um, so right, like one one issue with this solution is that like you you'll need like a really long binary vector for that. It will be very sparse, like that most of the values in this vector will be zeros, but it will be super long. If you have million of users and you have million of ads, the the just vector to just interact uh, to encode interactions between users and ads will be like a trillion trillion zeros, and like one of them will be one that corresponds to ad and user that you that you're ranking for, that you have in historical data. So that's too bad. And yeah, so basically what happens, like dimensionality explosion happens. It's very hard to handle. And there is a solution for that. The solution is called hashing trick. Basically what you do, you you explicitly limit the length of your like binary feature vector to some number. And for example, you say that I only want like 1 million of digits to my feature vector. And then you somehow map all the values you have in your historical sample, like add ID, user ID, add domain, interaction of user ID and add ID, you somehow map them into your one million long binary vector. Yeah, and like how you do it, usually you compute like some hash function and divided modular length of your vector and you get like uh, index in your binary vector that you want to increment. So that's like that operation is super simple and you can, you can try to reverse the hash if you need to for some reason. Uh, when you have to like analyze your model, but so yeah, so it works really well. It limits uh, like your model size, and there yeah, there will be some collisions, but actually it it will work fine. You need to you need to find like the optimal vector length for your solution. Uh, should be like you, you should just try different lengths and, and see whichever works for you. All right, and and like the final the final thing 
we want to discuss for this solution, how do you optimize, how do you minimize the the error, the, the loss function? <coughs> uh, how do you how do you find the optimal uh, model weights? So one one way to do that, as I said before, is like gradient descent. You just you just like update. It's an iterative process. You update model weights by like opposite to a gradient of the error function. But there is a better way to do it. Um, this is called follow the regularized lead proximal. This like super super confusing name, super confusing formula for this. But it works really well. It's covered well, like in the Google's article, a view from the trenches. And like, let me try to give you like some hand wavy explanation of what's going on here. So, the, so it's an iterative process, right? And like the next, the next value, the next step, uh, next iteration for model weights is computed as like the the value that minimizes like some equation that has like three parts to it. Yeah. So what are these like three parts? Uh, so the first part of it is like uh, just just product of gradients and the weight. <coughs> and that basically means that we just compute the weights. It's the same as gradient descent, just written in a different way. And it just said that uh, like we need we need to choose the weights of the model that will explain the historical data the best using all the historical data we have seen so far. And like G is a G like one uh, one semicolon T is just like sum of gradients on all the all the data we've seen. So one, one thing like this, the first component in the formula just means that this first component it just means that like let's find the weight that minimizes the function on all the all the historical data we've seen so far that's pretty much it uh the second component is a component that is like that brings like the name proximal so if you look into it what it does it says like when you compute the next update for the weights it should not be very different from the previous values yeah so like there is like l2 norm and so if if you if you continue to like compute the next update, it should like relatively close to like the previous values of the weights, and uh, like sigma s is just like a learning rate. It's some parameter, um, and it's per coordinate, and it's also like changes with time, and it's different for different coordinates. But like we don't we don't have to go deep into that right now for our intuition. So what this enforces is that it enforces when you compute updating the weights, it doesn't go crazy, and if you see some really weird sample in your training data which tries to push your model into like very different state it <coughs> try to push push your model weights and look at very different values like this will say like no let's not do it let's let let's change weights a little bit but not too much and that makes sense because if you if you do uh, like gradient like if you do parameter updates like on on like small sets of samples then it the gradient will be very different like on, on, on very different like separate samples it will average out into something meaningful but if you compute like compute on mini batches it will go like all the different ways finally like the the part of the equation that uh, gives a name to regularized leader is just like l1 regularization l1 norm so what what does it do it actually enforces sparsity of the vector w so that that's what like l1 norm like always does to the solution it enforces that the solution will mostly have zeros <coughs> and there will be like a small small number of non-zero value and like a lot of zero values in the, in the in the weights and arguably that's what we want right and we want we want uh, we want like sparse solution for two reasons one sparse solution first of all is easy to handle technically we don't have to store like the whole vector we can store a sparse vector basically we can just store non-zero values in the vector and uh, it will be like very easy to manipulate less memory less compute to multiply it better technically on the other hand like from business point of view probably it makes more sense if you see if you see big difference between two people interacting with the same ad probably this difference is coming uh, from some one particular factor maybe maybe like the user is interested one user is much more interested in the ad than the other one because user purchased from this advertiser before or maybe user is not interacting with the ad because something is broken on user side in this browser rendering is broken for the ad or like your tracking is broken from the, for the ad like for this browser or for this app version so when you see when you see like some probability difference between two users from business point of view you should attribute this probability difference probably to a small number of parameters that's what uh, that's what like L1 regularization enforces here, um, um, yeah. All right, and uh, yeah. So uh, we're lucky there is like a closed form solution for that, which is also in the article. So basically, 
you just update you just like update the weights according to the formula where like eta like is a is a learning rate uh, we have formula in previous slide how to compute that one and like that is also like some some formula that you like shows uh, to you how to compute it here and so you can see that from this closed form solution if if the weight update that you want to make is like below is below some number <coughs> which means that basically that like we know that updating setting this weight to non zero will improve prediction quality but it will increase number of non zero weights and you say like sometimes we are happy to sacrifice prediction quality on this historical sample for in sake of simplicity of the model that's what this means that what like this sparsity uh, update is right all right so that's pretty much it for this like um, uh, logistic regression solution so how like how, well, what do we think about it like is it any good so i think main challenge for this solution is like enforcing sparse model weights and once again this is like what how probably world works and probably the explanation for user interacting or not interacting with the ad is because of like a couple of important factors it's not because like a little bit of everything that's like one thing and like technically that's what you want but of course you want to enforce sparse model weights while the model prediction quality is good enough so doing that is like is one of the main challenges here um the pros of this model <coughs> that's like super easy to train <clears throat> It's fast to train. It's just like when once like your your model is basically like a scalar product, like some function around that. Uh, training is very stable. Like it converges to some result uh, more frequently than it doesn't. And it's very fast to serve. Like during serving time, this model is very fast to to apply. It's just like one scalar product once again. And usually, if you have sparse factors, it's very very easy to compute the product. It requires low memory. Um, yeah, so like su super super cool model. Uh, it usually has good calibration. Uh, that means that model predictions on average are really good, and and like for each particular user, also model predictions will be like within reason. Maybe like not super precise, but at least they will be reasonable. Um, and then like the model is interpretable. So if you if you if you're interested, like if you want to understand why the model predicted some number for some particular user and add, you can actually try to reverse. Uh, the hash computation and you can like look into the weights factor and you can see like where the prediction is coming from which which exactly factor contributed to prediction and you will have some human explanation is it from because of the website or because of user id or because of what <coughs> finally <coughs> the model has like really good prediction quality surprisingly and it can be made even better if you build like more complicated features so it can be your production model you can you can like uh, use this model and invest like a lot of your headcount effort into building more features and a little bit of headcount effort like into increasing your optimization algorithm for this model but like it, it, it could probably work well right and the cons to this model is like once again it it requires complicated features to work like if you want to bring it to advanced level and it cannot capture deeper structure of interactions between users and ads just just based on like user id and ad id numbers and let me show you like what i mean by that so like let, let's see we have like this kind of user and ad history and <coughs> we have ads like from different brands we have ads like from some cosmetics brands and we have ads like from some sports shoes brands and we showed some of the ads to some of the users and i show zero in this table if we show the ad and user did not interact and we show like I, I show like one in this table if we show this ad the user and user did interact and then like there is a lot of cases when we did not show the ad to the user and we want to predict what will happen if we show like for example for like consider user f user f did not see chanel ad and user f did not see like adidas ad. and so we want to predict what's the probability of user f engaging with chanel ad and what's the probability of user f engaging with adidas ad right so for if if you're a human looking on this table especially like with the coloring that i did here like it's super easy for you to to say that probably user will like i did this ad because and and will not like chanel ad because that this seems to be like a very well like defined cluster of cosmetics advertisers and cluster of sports shoes advertisers there is like a there are also clusters of users some users who prefer cosmetics who always click on cosmetics ads and like never click on sports shoes ad and users who prefer sports shoes right so and you can see that user f does not like cosmetics and user ad f likes sports shoes and adidas is sports shoes brand 
you can just see that from this table, right? So user F will probably like a data set, and user F probably will not like Chanel. So you can say that there's a human, but like the logistic regression model cannot see that. If you just supply user IDs and like add IDs, logistic regression model like will not be able to figure out that there are groups of users and groups of ads and usually like have particular interests that match particular ads. All right, so and like this this is like what the model should do, right? The model should like identify those clusters. And a uh, logistic regression model cannot do that unless you build special features for that. But the next design of the model can do exactly this. So the next design of the model is called like, uh, I call it multi-layer perceptrons uh, plus uh, factorization machines. <coughs> but you can like come up with different uh, names for it, like um, neural, neural factorization machines or like deep factorization machines. Uh, there is a number of articles about that. Uh, they all cover like slightly different aspects of, of the system, but like once you get the, the main idea, it will all like make sense. And there is a lot of similarity in all the approaches. I will try to explain it like now in 10 minutes. Right, so um, so what is like multi-level perceptron, like same as neural network or deep neural network, like same, same thing, right? What is it? It is actually like a lot of matrix multiplications and uh, the way it works, so there are multiple layers, right? And you have input data X and you, like you, you get input vector X, you multiply it by some matrix W0 and you add some vector P0 <coughs> and you apply some nonlinear function to that. And that's it, that the output is like output of the layer and then you can stack as many layers as you like and the output of the previous layer is the input to the next layer. So the next, next layer will again multiply the input by some matrix, add some vectors to it, apply some nonlinear function to that, and you can you can do that like many times. And nonlinear nonlinear functions uh, used are like I usually rectify the linear unit. You can see like the, the activation function like here. It's just like if the x is larger than zero, it's just like linear function. If it's like below zero, it's just zero. But there are multiple like variations of these functions. There are like a lot of people just working on a better version of the function. Some of them are like differentiable, some of them are not. Some of them like work better, some of them work worse. Like we're not covering that here. Usually like ReLU is good enough, but you can try a couple of different ones. All right. <coughs> so that's what neural network is. And neural networks are powerful enough to like, I claim that if you have enough layers and like enough uh, matrices are like decently sized, you have like powerful enough neural network like to make good predictions already, but you can help neural network to figure out some structure in your data by enforcing some structure on your neural network architecture. And we'll talk about that now. Uh, so this is like neural network park and what is a factorization machine? So, so this is a screenshot from the article and so what's what's happening here, right? So we have this like interaction matrix. The article is is looking at the users rating movies, uh, but in our case, we can say that it's user interacting with ads, right? And so users like users are users, and like items, items are ads. In our case, movies. In case of this article, and let's say like in the user, in, we show an ad to user. User clicked on the ad that's like one, and user we showed the user to ad user did not click on the ad that's like zero. Right, so we have this matrix of interactions, like same to the matrix I shown you before with cosmetic brands and shoe brands and users. So we have this matrix of interactions. Some of them we know, some of them we don't know, and we want to predict the ones we don't know. How do we? How do we do that? So the idea is like, why don't we represent this matrix, like big interaction matrix, <coughs> as a product of two smaller matrices? Right now, like one smaller matrix will be matrix about the users, the other smaller matrix will be matrix about the items, and the, these matrices are like user matrix for each user it will have like a vector of interests of the for the user and it will have like some some weights for each user there will be a vector of weights and each weight will uh, represent some interests that the user has and maybe like shoes or like pets or like I don't know like arts and the, the number there will be like high number means that user is interested a lot and lower number will be mean that the interest the user is not interested at all and the item matrix is the same it's like matrix that has a vector for each item that we have like for each ad or for each movie right and like and within this vector like also there will be a way describing or like how 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 much this movie is about sports or how much this movie is about art or about pets and we don't actually know like right we 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 represent this uh, like rating matrix as a product of the user matrix and item matrix we, we let the computer figure out 
what the weights are and we don't know what they refer to um right but there's like some hidden interest vectors for users and metrics and for items right and so <coughs> so once again <coughs> like what's going on here we represent the interactions that we know of as a like as a matrix product yeah we have like matrix of user like user matrix that has like embedding vectors that's how we call it interest vectors embedding vectors for users and embedding vectors for items and then when you want to compute prediction for user interacting with an item you just compute scalar vector for user embedding times uh, item embedding all right like once again we don't know what interests like what topics those numbers actually refer to right like it was it computer will identify those numbers somehow we don't we don't we cannot interpret that we can just say that the users that have the same number in the same position in the vector will have the same interest for some topic and if the user and the ad have the same number in some position in the vector it means that the user and the ad like have like matching topic the user is interest interested in this ad but we don't know what those interests actually refer to what those hidden topics refer to but actually maybe we don't need to know right the computer figures this figures this out for us so factorization machine is like the algorithm that basically represents historical interaction matrix as a product of user matrix and item matrix and they use like some different way to find those matrices, right? Because the question now is like, okay, so how do you actually find user matrix and item matrix, right? You can use gradient descent <coughs> and have some like error function and use gradient descent, or you can use it, like do it with neural networks. And that's what I'm proposing here. So how, how does the final solution look like, right? Like neural network based factorization. Let's look at it like step by step. So like, first of all, in this like neural network, uh, like, like let, first of all, like let's consider it only takes two types of values at the at the like uh, uh, inputs. It only takes like user ID and add ID. And when we train this network, we train it to predict will this user interact with this ad, right? That's it, like super simple solution. So, so the first layer, like the first step of this neural network, it computes like embeddings for users and like for for ads, right? So, like let let's look at like how it computes embeddings for users. It has some matrix matrix of the size like embedding embedding dimension this is something we choose by the number of users that we have or hash number of users and for each user it will have like an embedding vector in this matrix yeah and so the way we do it like we usually want to hash the user id also the way we did with a hashing trick so when we train this model or like uh, like uh, infer like a uh, service model we compute hash of a user id and based based on the hash of a user id we just look up the corresponding vector from the from the user embeddings matrix yeah the vector w in this example and then like we do the same for the add based on add id we can do the hash of add id and compute the index of the vector like in the in the add embedding matrix yeah so we and that, that's going to be like vector v so <clears throat> so right there's like <clears throat> matrix of user embeddings matrix of vector embeddings uh, of add embeddings and we just like look up uh look up corresponding embedding vectors for based on user id and ID. right so that's like the, the first step uh getting embeddings and the next step is like uh, interaction so then we compute some interaction between the embeddings and um, we take those two vectors and we usually we multiply them in some way you can compute like scalar product scalar product will give you just one number uh, you can compute like uh, vector column times like vector string which it gives you like the matrix n by n it's like all possible it's all possible products of components of one vector by component of another vector right so this is most like the most general way to compute it or it can be like pointwise uh, pointwise multiplication so like you just multiply corresponding components in each vectors but like do not sum them up so you just have the vector uh, like the output is a vector also length n and each component of this vector is like multiplication of corresponding components of input vector so like it's up to you to choose the interaction uh, and then on top of that you just have like a neural network that uh, that like takes takes this like output from interaction and then applies like some neural network layers on top of that and generates prediction so that's like the general idea of like this uh, neural network based factorization solution and and uh, now we can look at different oh sorry uh my screen share uh broke down uh let's try again all right and so right so now now let's look like at how like how companies like uh 
uh, talk about this. So there is like one article from Meta from 2021 that presents like the generalized solution of this problem. So basically it says like, okay, outside of user ID and ad ID, we have like a lot of features about user and ad. Maybe we have like some ID about like uh, which product is in the ad or uh, like about the user, we may have some, some IDs of ads user interacted before with or some IDs of the products user purchased before, <coughs> or IDs of the people user befriended or liked. And so just like whatever looks like ID kind of feature, we just compute the like embedding vector the same way we did before. And then like for the features, which are just numbers, we call these features dense features. It can be like number of clicks from coming from the user or number of clicks happen from the ad. We just like apply, apply neural network to that. And then once we compute like all those factors on the first level, embeddings uh, and like the bottom uh, MOP, we just like compute the interaction. And once again, you can choose like any interaction that you like. It can be just like a sum of all the numbers. It can be a dot product. It can be a concatenation. It can be like uh, point wise, like a element wise product. It can be like any 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 vector or matrix product you you can come up with. And then on top of that, like this will give you like some vector and matrix. It, as a result, and then on top of that, you apply another neural network again, and here you go, you got your prediction, right? So this is like, I think the most general design that was published in the article. And then other, oh uh, yeah, and then like one more thing that we probably like should have covered, but we are running out of time. So for, for finding optimal weights, you can use gradient descent, that's absolutely okay. Use like mini batch gradient descent works really well. There is like advanced method called, called Adam, uh, which use like momentum and adaptive learning rate, which works even better. Like I will not focus on that now. We are running out of time, but like if you want, you want to like you can look it up. Uh, it seems to work really well, and it's like not super sensitive to parameters, so you can you have some like freedom in choosing the parameters. And there is an article also about like Adam. Um, yeah, so like feel free to read it. Yeah. Right, it's usually implemented <coughs> in most machine learning frameworks. Right, so now, now, like, finally, let's look at like some solutions published by other companies. Uh, right, so here's a solution from Twitter, published in 2019. Uh, Twitter like S ranking, and here you go, like exactly what we discussed. There is a part of neural network for users, part for ads, and it builds like embeddings for users separately, uh, builds embeddings for ads separately, and then like computes combination of those like on the top and computes like, the output. Right, very similar, very similar to what we discussed. This is Twitter, and then like there is one more article from Reddit, as Frank and at Reddit. Like once again, the same idea. We have like two parts of the of this neural network. By the way, those neural networks are usually called like two tower neural networks. So one tower on the left is like dedicated to user. What we know about users, we have some like ID features about the user, and we compute embeddings, and maybe we have like some history or list of ID features coming from user. Once again. We like somehow average them out or like sum them up or do something with them, compute the meanings and uh, like apply some neural network on top and do the same for the ad. Also <coughs> apply neural network on top and then like compute some product. And in, th in this case, it's just like a dot product. So like you can, you can, uh, you can scale the solution very easily because you just compute the user part only once. And then for all the ads, you also compute like for each ad, you compute, compute this like once uh, independent of the user. And then you just compute dot product for this exact user and add interaction, which is like really fast dot product between two vectors, right? And like same for Google. Um, let's look at this. So Google says that okay, so you can use like two tower neural network on the left where you compute embedding separately for user and separately for item. Item in our case is add, and then do the dot product. Or as Google says, like you can use actually like full blown neural net to compute interactions. It will give you like more opportunities, but probably will be harder like to, to do right. Okay, and then Microsoft the same. And finally, there is like a super, uh, super like interesting article from Snapchat about how they do it. And you can also see like two tower design here, aggregation, and that interesting part that they add to this is like the model predicts multiple types of conversions at the same time. It predicts installs, purchases, or signups. And that's like a very cool idea and it definitely improves prediction quality. All right, so, uh, Pros and cons of this kind of solution, <coughs> I would say that the main challenge of like neural network based solution, is you get stuck in minimal, in a local minima. It's very like you, like the model finds some like suboptimal solution and gets stuck in. And it's one hand, on the other hand, stability is an issue and the model get, like might go crazy and some weights might go like into infinity values sometimes. 
and maybe maybe not when you start training the model, but you you roll out pre, like production solution, and then like maybe like you know in a couple of weeks after that there will be something strange in the like history. Maybe it's just like there will be new user, new ad, and the model will suddenly update the ways like to to plus infinity, and we'll all go like super super crazy. So like that's a real issue with neural networks. Uh, it's like super powerful, potentially it can model pretty much like anything and it can capture like deeper structure of interactions as we saw before that just from IDs, it can capture like what the meaning behind them is there are like any clusters of users and ads. And the cons is that like it's it's very highly, highly like uh, expensive model. It, it requires a lot of memory, it requires a lot of compute to train and serve. Of course you can optimize it and that's what people do, but definitely like yeah, that's like one thing. Another thing, it's totally not interpretable. It's impossible to understand why the model predicted something. And, and finally, it requires a lot of tricks. Like training good neural network is an art. And there are like a lot of machine learning tricks uh, that, that help you improve the prediction of the model and stability of the model. And like, it's like uh, different ways of normalizing the, the way it's like layer norm, batch norm, uh, like drop out. Um, like you know, like uh, skip connections, uh, like you name it. There's like a lot of a lot of tricks, and finally, the neural network based models have like calibration issues, and they like average predictions on some groups of users, and average predictions on some like even <coughs> predictions on some users might be like very 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 off, and it may end up predicting like one million uh, probability, one million percent interaction probability for, for some user for some ad once in a while, and you should be prepared for that. Or it might predict like very wrong probability for some group of users. The, the, so this kind of solution uh, is very good for ranking. So if you just need to order and you say that, okay, like which ad is the best to show to this user, that kind of decision, this the solution can probably make very well. But if you if you if you want exact prediction amount, it might be like quite off. And you, you have to be prepared for that and monitor that and correct. Right. I know we're out of time. Uh, I will spend like a couple of minutes to describe like how real life is different from what we just discussed and what we did not cover it's just two more slides so right so real life is shrinking uh if you look into the like snap article which is like once again like very cool describes like real life system uh first of all like you have multiple stages of ranking in real life you have a million of ads a lot of those ads will not even be eligible to show to this user because this user has different gender or age or the, like different language and you'll have to throw away like 90 percent of ads without even ranking them because they're not eligible for this user and then maybe you don't need to use like super precise models to rank ads in the beginning maybe you can like use some lightweight model first to just like have some general idea of which ads might even like be optimal for this user and which ads like will probably suck and you don't even like need to show them right and then once you narrow down the number of candidates like you you can use like hardcore like high power model to rank like small number of candidates to get like very precise predictions right so so designing this supporting this like multiple models and eligibility checks and <coughs> making sure that the models are aligned uh, because like the model prediction should be very well aligned right and, like and there are some couple of like some particular ways like of the uh, how the lightweight models can make mistakes that they will never know that they are mistaking that will like uh, drop the, the performance of the system so the like the interaction and feedback between those models like it's super important you have to address that and then like the model should be aligned right yeah. like another thing is that like you have to build the infrastructure for distributed training and serving like you have millions of users or, like billions of users you have to like you have to scale and it's just like a technical challenge and then usually there is a continuous improvement process for the models like there are people always working to improve the models they change the architecture of the models they change like training parameters they change like they create new features this should happen continuously there should be just people just working on that and to monitor that and to be able to like uh, understand if you are making it better or not you need to have some experimentation infrastructure like it should be very easy for an engineer to modify the model a little bit run experiment and say if it's better or not and like and then then like hundreds or like thousands of engineers should do that in parallel they just sit down and like every engineer improves the model a little bit runs the experiment says if it's better or not that's how you improve the system over time and like finally 
uh, you should have like monitoring and uh, investigation infrastructure. Like things will go wrong. Your predictions will be wrong, like super wrong once in a while. You'll have to be able to understand why. You'll have to be able to monitor that and you have to be able to understand why, or at least to narrow down your like prediction problems to some particular groups of users or groups of ads or particular user of ads. Maybe you cannot even say why, or like sometimes you can. Sometimes the model is broken and you just need to roll back to previous model snapshot. Sometimes like you, your training data is empty for some reason because like something failed, your paid data pipeline failed. You should be able like to monitor that. Right, so like that's one thing and that's just technical issues. And like the final slide is like, there are many more machine learning problems in advertising outside of ranking, right? And the one, one, one problem is incrementality. For example, you know that, okay, user saw the ad, user clicked and bought something. What if user did not see the ad? Like, I, are we just like, are we just like showing ads to the users who are already interested in buying our products? Or did we actually change something like by showing that? It's very hard to measure that. How much users intent changed because we showed that. <coughs> and like, it's a, it's, a, it's a cool problem working on that. Another problem is like exploration versus exploitation. And you want like your model might get like stuck in predicting some correct values for the users for the users and ads combinations it have seen but maybe it's missing something and maybe you need to like explore more user ad combinations maybe you should like serve some ads to more users and see will it work out or not and it's 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 really difficult to do with ads because when you are exploring you're probably doing something suboptimal like most of the time if you show like some ad which you did not rank like as a high performing ad to some user and you're probably probably it will performance will go down most of the time and you someone will have to pay for that and usually it's the advertiser and the advertiser will be very unhappy to pay for your exploration it's like you gain long-term better predictions but short term you sacrifice advertisers budgets advertisers do not like that uh, there is an integrity problem uh or like if it's kind of social network social platform there will be there will be content on social platform that you don't want to show ads next to and then there will be ads if you have like highly scalable system which has like millions of ads people will try to advertise like a lot of like dodgy stuff and probably you don't want all of that on your platform being advertised so you have to detect what the ad is advertising like re really and if it goes along with your community standards or not <coughs> some social networks do not advertise like medical devices or some social networks do not advertise like uh, medicines and so you have to detect if the ad is like is actually advertising like any medical topic and if it's allowed on the platform uh, right and there's like there is there is much more i think like let's say like one more thing like for example the last one for this talk is like uh like these days users have like freedom to opt out of online tracking and User may say, like, you know what? I don't want anyone like, to track my activity online. I don't want anyone to collect my data online. And this way, if the user clicks on the ad, goes to the website, and buys something, if user opted out of tracking, the, the ads platform will not know did user actually buy something or not. This will break, like, the whole, like, fit the model on historical data um, solution, right? Because there will be no historical data. We don't have the labels. We don't know did the user interact with the ad or not. And that's like a real issue. There are a lot of users who opt out of tracking. And like you have to find a way to extrapolate your predictions to those users when you're ranking ads. And you also have to like have to have a way to monitor your ad performance on those users. That's like a really cool problem. How do you do it so that you don't track the users on one hand? Uh, but then on the other hand, you like somehow predict some aggregate numbers, uh, like which which are still like compliant with what you promised in terms of tracking and privacy but allow you to monitor some like at least something about users right so okay i think i think that's pretty much it uh, for our talk today uh i don't think if we have any like questions in the audience i see there are not so many people in the audience but like please if you have questions uh, in the audience like this is the right time to ask them thanks a lot uh, uh sure. for your talk uh is uh, quite interesting, by the way, uh, for taking toward the uh, uh, ads ranking in real life and also at the production grade uh, uh, advertisement side. So, uh, so oh, I do have one question. So, uh, because you know, in ads ranking, we also care about. I mean, the the platforms like you know, ranking the advertisement also care about the 
uh, quality of the generated ads, right? If it is like, of course, an image or like, you know, or you have like a multimodal content text with emails. So how do you like, <laughs> I think in real life or production grid uh, uh, ads platform, uh, you also have like a, a, a quality check of the ads uh, during the, uh, like, you know, while user navigating through, you know, generated ads. So do, do you do like after you get uh, user interaction with the item or like you collect like those behaviors like you know impressions or more sort of a click uh, kind of data right so so okay i think i understand the question so you say that there might be some ads that technically do not violate the guidelines but they're still not yeah legal. yeah and, it might not be desirable for some users right so uh, yeah. because i so i work uh, like so i do like two tower uh, kind of like models uh, so I was like uh, mainly do CTR, but like I mean in academ academia, so I don't have much idea like how you know industry grid ads uh, ranking platform do they care about quality uh, of the ads that the platform generating? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I I think of course, of course, and you're absolutely right. The problem is that if you just do ads ranking as I described, optimizing for like clicks or conversions, the system is super short-sighted. And it only optimizes like for whatever happens right now and ad quality influences long-term engagement from the user, like if the user will come back to the platform. And yeah, just like optimizing for clicks, like totally, totally does not optimize for long-term. So yeah, and, and you are right that there is like some quality part of the bid I, I think there was a poster from there was a poster from Meta this year at the at the Rexis conference. I was in Rexis. Uh, I think it was, it was it was from the U.S. team, uh, if I remember correctly. Yeah, nobody was from London, but uh, yeah, I saw some like on uh, papers on Bandit and all uh, the reinforcement learning approaches for uh, drawing engagement. But it was like mainly I think on um, on Bandit side, uh, and they were like having this CTR, of course, they use like recall metric, but they're like more focused on like industry grade, like A-B testing, but we don't like, uh, because the quality check, I mean, if you're using like multi-model kind of like recommendation, you're doing like, not just like one modality, uh, text to text, or maybe like text to image plus text, like, you know, news, like, you know, or social, uh, so what? I, so so my question is, I'll, I'll just narrow it down. So uh, because you have this, like, of course, user item. So you have like this two stage. I think most companies do that. I think Netflix or Pinterest, like, they do have this kind of like who deals with like multimodal content, right? So do they have this quality check during the uh, uh, the? So once they, they add the rank, like once you generate and then you add the rank. So they do the quality check after user is started to be on board or like they do the quality check once you kind of like ranked it over. So you have like ranked and then you also uh, get the retrieval performance of the generated content, right? So I think the explicit way to like, I mean, that's what in academic, we like kind of like inspect down. So we, we get to know like retrieval performance of the generated content. So you can say the like you know the retrieval of course the content is good but we don't know if it is uh if the user is interested or not like is it desirable to him or not so we do like do the platform perform implicit quality check like of the ads and that is like more uh, gets uh, uh sure. yeah so user so you kind of like yeah so what what i from what i know uh, people do <coughs> is if, if you can say that what does it mean low quality ad for example you say that low quality ad means that user will say don't show this ad to me again because like on some ad platforms you can do that or you say that low quality ad means that user clicks on the ad goes to the website and then closes the website in yeah. like within one second yeah so if, if you if you can map your quality idea to some particular events happening or not happening then you can build prediction models for that and you can say okay so to, so when we compute the bid uh 
when we rank the ads, we compute this bit, like right, which is expected dollar value of the set if we show it to the user. Uh, we also add to that bit like the quality part, and you need to put some ad hoc multiplier because like, it's very hard to map quality units like to dollars. So you put some ad hoc multiplier in there, and and you say like, okay, the, what is the probability of user saying like, please don't show me this ad? So you penalize your bid by that, and then. Mm -hmm. What's the probability of user bouncing off the website and you penalize your bid by that? And then you maybe you can come up like with a lot of different events that indicate yeah. that this low quality, and you just make prediction of all these like negative events, and then you somehow combine them like as a just like linear combination or like mm -hmm. function of that. Like, but I, I think from what I understand is like a super ad hoc solution, it changes a lot. Yeah. And like there are usually some multipliers and some predictions, mm -hmm. but it's very hard. Like I, I don't think there is like you know like very very well framed way of thinking about it. I think it's just like super I see, I see, yeah. I see, see. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, I think there's no formal way like a standardized way to you know tackle this. But yeah, as you said, uh, it depends on like you know uh, you, you kind of like if you get uh, kind of like model this this bouncing back of the users let's say if they, if they don't buy so of course it's a low quality that I expect so yeah mm -hmm. i think uh, for the platform it will be low quality but looking from the user side if if, if the user is not interested then it will become low quality and with respect to the user right so yeah it, i think it makes sense uh, uh, thanks for the your answer i think uh, it's informative uh, yeah, no problem no problem all right. Any any more any more questions? On this no, one? I think uh, uh, that's all. All right. I yeah. also work in recommender system, but uh, as uh, mm -hmm. I work on conversation data. So. Uh, oh, that's really cool. Yes. Cool, cool. You can use like LLMs and stuff, probably. Right. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, these days like two towers. So like I, I've worked on like two towers. So like uh, benchmarking some theoretical uh justification like some guarantee for like because two towers like more like you know it's all deep, <laughs> deep neural network so uh we don't know what's happening inside so i work on uh building mathematical models to some guarantee some of the um you know nice. recommendation performance so yeah that's what i do yeah that's that's very interesting like very interesting research i think yeah, I think in I think in industry people are not always interested in like any guarantees. They just try whatever works. Uh, I mean, academic, you know, you you pretty much aware of. I, I mean, I'm at the university uh, University of Surrey, so I'm also based in UK. Yeah, nice. yeah. All right. Okay. All right. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Thanks for listening uh, to the talk and for the question. Yeah. Thanks and uh, Merry Christmas in advance. <laughs> yeah. 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 To you too. Yeah. Yeah. Happy holidays. Thank you. Bye.